So, um, Isaac, the next slide. So, we are going to discuss uh, the management principle of a fracture. And then we're going to use the following outline. We're going to start with the introduction. We have to make diagnosis. We have to treat these patients. Also discuss the complication and then conclude. Next slide, please. Sorry, bear with us. So I'm not the one controlling the slide. Okay. So what we no what is what is a fracture? By the right hand corner there, by the left hand corner of the screen, you can see a discontinuity in between the, fe the femoral shaft as well as the proximal aspect of that shaft. So fracture, as we know from a layman, is just a break in bone. So we describe fracture, we define it as a break in the structural continuity of the bone with associated soft tissue or injury. Uh, because fracture, the bone cannot break alone. Usually it breaks along with what soft tissue injury from what the fracture ends. So to have a complete definition, we all must also recognize the soft tissue damage associated with fracture. So previously we used to say just a break, but currently now the current definition accepted worldwide is when we have a structural, um, um, structural uh, discontinuity in a bone with associated soft tissue injury. Now fracture can occur through the epiphysis and can also occur through the growth plate called epiphysial growth plate. So it's not only just the shaft, any part of the bone can be fractured. So we have to take that into cognizance. However, the management of uh, fracture is multidisciplinary. It involves a lot of doctors, okay? Because fracture alone may not just suffice. The patient may also come with other life-threatening issues. And as such, we have to involve other specialty in management of a multiply injured patient presenting with a fracture. Next slide. Now, how does this fracture occur? What is the etiology? What is the mechanism of injury? Most of we know most of the fracture occurs within an environment results from trauma. And what is trauma? We said trauma is what an exchange of what energy between the environment and the body, which is beyond the resilient of that very word body, and it results in an injury. So most often in our environment, it can be as a result of a direct force, okay, from trauma, or it could be from an indirect force, usually resulting in a break in the continuity of that bone. So it also suffice to note that if we subject a bone to tension on both sides, it's going to fracture. And usually the type of fracture we have when we have a tensional force is what a transverse fracture. So it depends on the amount of force or the type of force acting on a bone that will determine the type of fracture you will have. If you decide to bend the bone, it's going to break with a butterfly fragment at the other end. If you compress a bone too, it's going to buckle and it's going to give an oblique fracture. So irrespective of whatever force you apply, provided it's enough, it can break a bone, okay? And this particular energy from trauma can either be high energy, usually from a road traffic accident, it could be from high velocity gunshots, okay? It could also be from low energy. Somebody may just be walking and be just stripped or sleep, and he falls on an outstretched hand and breaks the bone or fracture the bone. So it could also be, it could also be from penetrating injury, either from a stab or it could also be from um, from a high velocity gunshot or a low velocity gunshot, depending on the range. Okay, all these can result in fracture. It could be for fall from height. It's a form of trauma, okay? So it could also be from a pathologic condition resulting from a weakened bone. You may have a bone cyst or you may have infection of the bone, osteo uh, chronic osteomyelitis, which may 
weaken the integrity of that particular bone. And any slight force can result in the fracture. So when it occurs in a disease bone, we call it a pathologic one, fracture, and usually result from pathologic condition of the bone. It could also be a stress fracture. If you see the military people, when they march, they keep marching and keep marching. So they develop some micro trauma, usually to the second metatarsal, and they now develop pain, swelling. And if you do an X-ray in some of them, you see a fracture. We call it a match fracture. It's as a result of what a big Are we together? Yeah, so we need to classify uh, fractures because sure is that so that when we speak, somebody will stand everybody will be on the same page as a scientist and know what we are talking about okay so there is a need to classify fracture it help us to uh, determine the type of treatment we are going to offer the patients and also for research it allows for uniformity in research so there is a need to classify fractures and the common one we have around the common classification is is the fracture open or is it closed if it is if it is closed what we mean by a closed fracture now we define fracture earlier on as a break in the continuity of the bone with associated soft tissue word injury. Now, if a fracture occurs, there's usually a collection of blood, which we call hematoma. This very hematoma, if there is a breach in the skin, that hematoma is going to pour out as an altered blood, isn't it? If we have seen an open fracture before. So once we have a fracture and the fracture hematoma communicates with the external environment, because there is a breach in the skin, we call it what? An open fracture. However, there are certain fractures, especially femoral fracture, some in the thigh. You don't see the fracture hematoma. You only notice deformity. The fracture hematoma does not communicate with the environment. And in that condition, we call it what? a closed fracture. Though the drawbacks with an open fracture is that the skin, the barrier, the skin has been breached. So there, there will be likely communication between the body and the external environment. And that may be a route for what microorganism and what contaminants to enter into the body system. And as such, the risk of infection is very high when we have an open fracture compared to what a closed fracture. Also, fracture can be Classify based on whether it is a complete fracture or an incomplete fracture. There is a break in all the cortices through and through the bone, and the bone separates into two or more fragments. So once we have a complete discontinuity, we call it a complete word fracture. But at times, only one side or only one cortex. And it may not go through and through. So once we have a fracture that does not go through and through completely through the uh, cortices, we call it an incomplete fracture. Usually in children, we see that commonly, we call it either a green stick fracture or we call it what a buccal fracture. One or two of the cortices and the others are intact. So we can also use that classification to classify fracture. Then we can also classify fracture based on the fracture line or the fracture pattern we see on our X-rays, okay? Now, when it goes through and through, and the fracture line, okay, the fracture line sustain an angle of at least less than 35 degrees, okay, with the longitudinal axis through the horizontal, taking a reference through a horizontal line, we call it a transverse fracture, okay? So 
Once the angle is less than 35 degrees, I didn't have the picture here, but when you draw a line through the fracture line, okay, and then the longitudinal axis, you can see uh, them drawing the longitudinal axis. So the angle that fracture line substance, okay, with, with the horizontal line drawn to that vertical line, okay, once it's less than 35 or 30 degrees, we'll call it a transverse fracture. But if it is greater than 35 degrees or greater than 30, according to AO, we'll call it an oblique fracture. So the oblique could be a short oblique, could be a long oblique, okay? Then we also have a, I mean, a spiral fracture. When there is a twist in the bone, you see the fracture line going around the cortices of the bone, giving an S-shaped uh, outline. So we we'll call that a spiral fracture. It's usually due to what torsional forces, rotational forces. Okay, for the oblique, for the oblique fracture is we said it's due to what compression. Because if you look at the arrow on top, you're showing there is a compression over that particular bone. So a compressional force will give you an oblique fracture. Okay. Now, if you also look at we call something cumulated fractures. Okay, when the bone, the, the bone fragments, okay, are more than one. Okay. And into various species, we'll call it what a comminuted fracture. Okay. So you can see two fracture line, and then in between it, you see a lot of fracture line, the bone uh, broke into different pieces. So that particular wedge now makes it a cumulated fracture. Then we we'll, we'll, if you go also to the next slide, we'll see what we call a butterfly fragment, okay? You see a culminated fracture because we have more than two uh, pieces of uh, bone or two, more than two fragments of bone there. So we term that as a culminated fracture. But the, the fragment we are seeing is, is, is large and in a single piece. And so we call it a butterfly fragment. Because if you look at a butterfly, the wing, the wing on each side of the butterfly looks like that wedge. So they call it a butterfly fragment, okay? All right. Then we also have what we call segmental fracture. When a fracture line, when we have uh, two fractures or two fracture line with an intervening segment in between the fragments, okay? It is what each of them are classified as a segment of a bone. And so we call that a segmental fracture. So in segmental fracture, you have two fracture lines, and in between it, we have an intact floating segment. Okay, we have an intact bone in between. So we'll call that what a segmental fracture. Then fractures were also named based on the basis of those who discovered those fractures. So we call we call that kind of classification what an eponyms or eponymical classification of fractures. They were named after people do this kind of classification. Usually we don't use it again because there is no standardization and not all the fractures are named after individuals. So you are going to lose out if we continue to use eponyms to describe fractures. We could remember Abraham Collins in 1814 when he described the coolest extra articular fracture, okay? So that was named after him as a coolest fracture. We also have what we call Potts fracture by Pavasia Potts. He described a bar malolar fracture of the ankle. Put the medial and the lateral malolus on your ankle are fractured. He termed it as what? A Potts fracture. Then other people, uh, Cotton also described his own fracture, which we call Cotton's fracture. Cottings described a trimalolar fracture of the ankle, both medial lateral and the posterior malolus. So once they are fractured, we'll call it Cottings fracture. However, as I said earlier on, we can use this fracture because not all fractures are named. Okay, so we currently don't use eponyma, but in exams, you can find them and they will ask you to describe what those fractures are just for historical perspective, okay? So next slide. 
Then currently, what uh, is being advocated for currently in the orthopedic world now is what we call the alphanumeric classification, or otherwise called the OA or the OTA fracture classification. Okay, it was developed in the 60s by Muller and his colleagues. Okay, and here usually numbers are being assigned to each of the bone. Okay, and so the humerus is usually termed as one, bone number one. The forearm bones are called bone number two, both radius and ulna. Then the femur is termed number three. Then tibia and fibula is termed number four. And according to Mola, he has named all the body uh, bones from one to nine. So there is what we call the famous AO dance. Okay, maybe later I will, I will um, video myself on the AO dance, okay? And then so that it's just for recollection of those uh, bones so that you don't forget. So that you don't forget, okay? So the fifth one is your lumbar vertebrae. Your lumbar vertebrae is the fifth bone, okay? Then your pelvis, if you shake your pelvis round, wind it round, that is the sixth bone, okay? Then the seventh bone is, when you clap your hands, your hands, the, the bones in the fingers are termed seven, okay? And then when you hit your feet on the ground, okay, it is termed eight. Then your score is bone number nine. So there is a famous dance we call the AO, dance that demonstrates the various bones that you will not forget, okay? It is quite scientific because each of the bones have been assigned numbers as well as alphabets to be able to describe the fracture properly and what can be done. So currently they are advocating for the adoption of uh, the AO alphanumeric classification. Now, after numbering the bone, the bone also has segments. We have the proximal segments, okay, which is the proximal metaphysial region of that bone. We have the diaphysis at the middle, and then we have the distal what metaphysial region of the bone, okay? Now, the proximal segment of that bone is usually termed A, okay? Then the diaphysial region is termed B, okay? Then the uh, the, the metaphysial region distal to the uh, diaphysis is termed C, okay? Now, hello, are you with me? Yes, we're yes, with you. So we're with you. Okay, all right. Maybe we'll just give you a brief, we've lost, uh, Isaac, we've lost the screen. Is there light? Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, as I said earlier on the proximal metaphysis, sorry, the proximal metaphysis is called one, okay? Then the diaphysis is called two. Then the distal metaphysis is called three. Then each of them are further being divided into subtype. The proximal metaphysis could be A, if it is extra articular, the fracture is extra articular, B, if it is partially articular, C, if it is totally articular, all the fractures are within the. If you come to the aphysis also, it can become A, if it involves what? If it's a simple fracture, it could either be a spiral fracture or a transverse fracture or an oblique fracture. They are all classified under E. Then B is when we have a wedge fracture. That is, you have a butterfly fragment, it's termed B. And then C, if there is combination of that particular fracture, okay? So I'm going to just demonstrate the next slide, please. How we classified a fracture using the AO. So the proximal, if you look at this diagram, this was called from the AO. 
the prognosis, we have the types A, B, C. And then on the side, we have the segments. The segment, the first segment there is the proximal uh, metaphysical region. Okay. And on the proximal metaphysical region, the types is either we have A, as we said, which is the fracture you can see just extra articular. It is B when it is partially articular. The line now went from outside articular, I mean, extra articular into the joint articular. Then C, the entire fragment is within the joint. Okay. So once we have one A, what we know is that we have an extra articular proximal fracture. Once we have one B, we know that the fracture has extended into the joint, partially articular. Once it is C, we know it's totally what? Articular. Therefore, aphysis in the second region, which is term two, okay? Then the subclass, it could be a simple fragment, as I told you, which would be called A. Then when there is a wedge, a butterfly fragment, it is term type B. And then if it is accumulated, it is term, uh, is term type C, okay? And then similar thing goes, because the, the, the distal segment, the third segment is also a metaphysical region. A of it is still extra articular, B of it is still partially articular, and C of it is totally what articular. Can we go to the next slide? I'll be speaking a lot of grammar. Let's go and look at it practically. Oh, oh, oh. go to the next. Uh, I mean, go, go back. Oh, oh, there is a slide that is missing. All right, go back. Go forward. Let me see. Down. Okay, sorry. All right, let's just go back. There is a slide that is missing. Okay, that I edited, but no problem. We'll discuss it. So let me just say, uh, we'll come back to that classification when we go to an to imaging study and there is an X-ray and I'll talk about that, okay? Now also for open fractures, there are also classification we use for open fracture. We call it the Gostilo and Anderson classification, which was developed in 1982 by Gostilo and his colleague. And uh, he did a simple classification into three types, type one, two, and three though type three is subdivided into A, B, and C. And this classification he did was based on one, the size of the wound. Two, it was based on also the energy involved in that particular fracture, whether it's high energy, moderate energy, or low energy. And then C, it was based on the degree of contamination of that particular wound. So he described type one open fracture as a fracture in which the wound size is less than one centimeter. The energy is a minimal energy and minimal energy usually results in what? A simple fracture, either an oblique or a spiral or a transverse fracture. And then the level of contamination is usually minimal because it's like a puncture. And the puncture is usually from in out. That's the bone fragment, okay? Okay. And so the level of contamination is usually minimal. For Gosilo type two, it describes that the wound size is between two and 10 degrees. That is greater than one centimeter and less than 10 centimeter. And the energy is usually a moderate energy. Here, you now start seeing some level of culmination of the fracture. That tells you that the energy is higher than that that causes a simple fracture. Okay, and then the com contamination is usually what moderate. Then in type three, it describes it that the wound size is usually greater than 10 centimeter. And it's usually as a result of high energy. And high energy causes what? Combination of what? Fractures. It makes them move into segment. When you start having segmental fracture, it tells you that the energy that's, that the uh, cost that fracture is quite high for it to break at two or more points. Okay, now it can either be a, 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 a three B So for a type three A, a the wood sustained can be close.
use a skin graft and then a B, a type three B is when the wound cannot come together after your debridement. The wound cannot come together. You require other soft tissue reconstruction to be able to cover it, okay? So you may require a flap to be able to cover it. So once you have such fracture, you tell me 3C, when it involves a major arterial injury that will require repair, otherwise you lose that particular limb. So there is no hard and fast rule about the Gosselo and Anderson because there is, it is quite simple. However, there are certain drawbacks with it. And this Gosselo and Anderson grading is done after you have taken the patient to theater and you have done the uh, debridement. Though in this part of the world, mostly we, we, we grade it before we do a debridement. But ideally you should score your open fracture after your debridement. Because after debridement, you should be able to check whether you can close that wound primarily or you require a soft tissue cover. Or if there is a major arterial injury that requires an urgent repair, then you can call that a Gostil and Anderson 3C. So this, this, this classification is very, very important when we have an open fracture because it, it, it tells us what to do or how to manage that particular fracture. Next slide. So we have to, we have to make a, a diagnosis. Who presents those who come with fracture. They usually present, usually in an uh, emergency, uh, in, in, the, in, in an emergency, usually as an emergency, because the, some of them come with uh, multiple injury, usually that from road traffic accidents or from gunshot injury or from fall from height, okay? Or during disasters, when there is a building collapse, okay? That can result in trauma, fractures and all that. So you usually see them majorly as an emergency. They usually present to us as an emergency. However, some of them can present as an elective, especially those who sustain uh, some injury, maybe a mild injury, sustain fracture, and decide to go to the traditional bone setter. They may later come with complications such as non, I mean, fracture non-union. So it's still term a fracture. So those one come, they are very cold cases. They are not emergency. There's no life-threatening situation about them. But in our environment, what we mostly see is the emergency presentation of fractures, okay? Because there are one or two life-threatening conditions that if not taken care of, we will lose the patient entirely. So what do we do when we, they present in emergency? We have to resuscitate these patients because the aim, the goal of any emergency setting is to one, to save life, then followed by save limb then we cannot talk about cosmesis. So life must be saved first. And as such, we have to quickly resuscitate this patient based on advanced trauma life support protocol using your ABC of resuscitation. And we all know the component of the resuscitation. A is what? The primary survey is what? To identify life-threatening condition and urgently address them. So you are... You are identifying the problem and simultaneously you are trying to what? Treat those conditions, those life-threatening conditions. So the ABC of the resuscitation, A is what? Maintenance of your airway, okay? And what do we mean by that? The airway of the individual has to be patterned so that the patient can breathe, okay? and there'll be oxygenation. I mean, there'll be circulation of oxygenation and all that, okay? And better saturation. Why do we take care of the C-spine? Because we don't want to complete what? An incomplete C-spine injury. Because once you have a higher spinal injury, it will cause paralysis of the individual. So we have to what? Maintain, we have to stabilize the C-spine using what? Our Philadelphia what? Collar, okay? with uh, sandbags and also you can put also a head strap if you are using uh, the spinal board, okay? 
But in this part of the world where we don't have spinal boards, uh, most of our uh, ambulances or most people who goes to the scene of the accident to evacuate them don't have the spine board. We the two sides of the neck to be able to stabilize it. And once the patient is in the emergency, in the emergency, you first of all have to apply your cervical collar. And then while trying to what? Maintain your airway. The B of it is to ensure breathing and also oxygenation. Usually the patient has some oxygen depth from the trauma, okay? So usually it's advocated to place the patient on oxygen and usually around 15 liters per minute, high flow for them, okay? In order to correct the oxygen depth. Then also you look for other lethal injuries in the chest that can cause what life-threatening conditions such as pneumothorax, hemothorax, okay, open chest wound. And also they, are, they are quite lethal and so they have to be taken care of, okay? The atom FC, okay, has to be taken care of at that particular point. Then C is the circulation. You quickly have to secure wide ball cannula in your anticubital veins. And then you obtain sample for what? Your hemogram as well as your baseline investigation. If it's a woman, you may also have to do a pregnancy test. Hello? So you also have to do a pregnancy test, okay? If it's a woman, okay? So in your C, I mean, in, still in your C of resuscitation, that is where you do, uh, you give your warm fluids, okay? You, you give the patient warm fluids. You give the patient warm fluids, okay, to maintain the circulation, and then you pass your urethral catheter to monitor the urine output in this particular patient. That gives you an assessment of the level of tissue perfusion in that particular patient. Then you may also put, if you have your pulse oximeter, you have to apply your pulse oximeter to check your saturation. If you have ECG, you also have to put your ECG legs. And then at that particular point, you quickly take an X-ray. We we'll call it the trauma series. You take an AP, I mean, you take a lateral cervical spine to look to screen for any cervical injury, fractures. Then you also take AP anterior posterior of the chest and also anterior posterior of the pelvis. We call it a trauma series. Okay, you have to take that because you can have some awkward problems within the chest that can cause problems for this individual, such as pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax. Uh, we also have a pneumothorax, okay? And then also in the pelvic, you could also have what? Bleeding or pelvic injury that result in loss of at least uh, two to three liters of blood, which can cause shock in this particular patient, okay? So you quickly have to resuscitate this patient and then continue to reevaluate the patient until the patient becomes stable, okay? So you also have to do a quick examination. Because the patient can present as a fully traumatized patient, maybe unconscious, okay? So you have to assess the glycocoma score of that particular patient to note the level of consciousness. Then you also have to check his conjunctiva, also his mucus and everything for dehydration. You also want to check for anemia, okay? Whether the person is pain, okay? Because patient may have also lost blood. So you want to check that, okay? Then you need to check the chest because a trauma patient, you need to examine the patient from head to toe and also from front to back so that you don't miss any injury. So when you go to the chest, you want to look at it. You want to inspect the chest. Is, is there chest movement? Is there respiration? You want to know to the rate. You want to check for a trachea centrality. Is the trachea central? Are there any open wound bruises over the chest? Okay. We we'll call those those signs or those bruises pattern signs. Okay, it could be somebody who was trapped between the seat belts during the accident. You may see some of those bruises and the line there, the pattern over the chest. So it can also give you a clue of the nature of um, the nature of injury the chest must have sustained. Okay, so you also have to check for tenderness. We we'll call it chest compression tenderness. You compress the upper zone, the middle zone and the lower zone of the chest. 
Okay, if there is tenderness, you have to know because it could connote that there is either an injury to the musculoskeletal system on that particular side, either a normal uh, injury, okay, which you can elicit as tenderness. Okay, then you then list, you need to listen to the chest, okay, for breath sounds or added sounds. Okay, is it more food? Is it absent? You want to know because if there is fluid or air there, it can be more food, okay? All right. Then you also have to percuss your chest. When you percuss the chest, is it, are you, is it hyperresonance? If hyperresonance is telling you likely you have a pneumothorax, okay? An air collection there. But if it is stone, stone I mean stone to dull or, or stony dull as we call it, then it means there is a fluid collection there, okay? So that will also raise your suspicion and also your diagnosis that you have a hemothorax. Okay. Uh, you also have to check your cardiovascular system. You have to note the pulse, the volume of the pulse, because if your pulse is full, it tells you, okay, you don't have much loss. But if the, if the volume of your pulse is, is, is reduced, then you know the patient is undergoing shock. Okay. So, and also you need to note the pulse rate. If it is tachycardic, you know, ah, this person is in a particular grade of shock, okay? So pulse alone can give you a lot of information about a trauma patient. Pressure, hmm? is the blood pressure normal? Is it hypotensive, is it low? Okay, you need to note that, okay? Because that gives you an idea if the patient is also in shock. Okay, because a blood pressure of 90, less than 90, 60, connotes that there is likely what? A shock ongoing, okay? And usually what? A hypovolemic shock, okay? There are different types of shock. So in another lecture, they will take you through the various type of shock that you can have because you also have a spinal shock, okay? A, a neurogenic shock, all right? So also the abdomen, you have to what? Examine the abdomen, okay? You inspect the abdomen, for any bruises, for any pattern sign, okay? Then you prepare the abdomen quadrant by quadrant, okay? Eliciting tenderness, okay? And if there is a tenderness in a particular region, it tells you there is, there is particular what? Quadrant, okay? You also listen to the voice sound of the individual, okay? Whether it's no more active or whether it's hypoactive, they all give you an information whether there is a peritonitis or an ongoing bleeding into the abdomen, okay? Then what concerns us mostly is the musculoskeletal injury. So you also have to look at the musculoskeletal injury, okay? You look at the, the limbs, the upper limbs, the trunk, you look at the back for the spine, you look at the lower limbs. They are looking for any bruises, any obvious wound, they are looking for any obvious deformity. Okay, because most of the fracture will present as deformity, except those that are not displaced. They may, the deformity may not be quite obvious, but you may note swelling, which may give it away, okay? Or the abnormal movement of that particular limb, okay? Because the individual cannot control the distal aspect of that particular uh, limb. The distal aspect of that fracture cannot control that particular limb, okay? So usually you don't check for crepitus. What we call crepitus is that the, some people want to move the fracture fragment so that the bone ends rub each other and you feel that uh, griddle uh, motion, but it's not advised because that is going to provoke more pain and more injury. Once there is a fracture, there is a deformity, it is obvious and there is tenderness, it is obvious. The X-ray is, en is enough to be able to make the diagnosis for you, okay? So you can make your suspicion right from your clinical examination, from your swelling, your tenderness, okay? The abnormal movement that you can see in the limb, okay? And then you also assess your distant neurovascular status, okay? Now we have to investigate this patient. Plain radiograph. With plain radiograph, we can make a complete diagnosis of a fracture, okay? So usually you request for a trauma series, as I said, and usually trauma series are done during your ABC of resuscitation. Okay, I uh, usually you check for the lateral C spine, you do the anteroposterior of the chest. I also check for what 
your AP pelvis, okay? Looking for any occult um, fractures or pathology in that particular region. And when you are taking the X-rays of the particular limb affected, it is advisable to follow the rule of tools, otherwise you are going to miss an injury, okay? So the rules of two of X-rays, you have to take two views, for the two views, an AP view and a lateral view. That is the minimum. We orthogonal to each other, okay? So once you have a lateral and an AP view, that suffices on that rule of two, so that you'll be able to describe the type of fracture, the displacement of the fracture, the position of the fracture uh, segments, okay? Then it must show two joints, the joint below that fracture and the joint above the fracture. If you can look at the X-ray we'll put there, it's an adequate X-ray because the, the radius as well as the owner shaft has been fractured and we can see the joint above as well as the joint what below. And there are two X-rays. We have an AP X-ray and we also have the lateral one. The lateral one is marked L by the right, I mean by, by the topmost corner of it, okay? Now, also you need to take X-ray of two limbs, but usually the X-ray of two limbs is usually done for children, pediatrics, because some of them have growth plates that resembles or that looks like a fracture. So usually it's advocate, it's, we advocate that you take two of the limbs, okay? You take the right limb and you take the left limb, and then you compare the two, okay? And when you compare the two, you'll be able to identify what is a fracture and what is not a fracture. So in children, you have to do what? X-ray of both limbs, okay? The right as well as the left for comparison. And then you have to take your X-ray at two occasions, okay? After the injury, you take your X-ray, when you now intervene, you take your X-ray. Also, at times, there are certain fractures that are not obvious during their presentation at the emergency. Example of them is the scaphoid fracture, the one of the copper bones in the hand, the scaphoid fracture. Sometimes it's not visible in the emergency. So usually, you wait for at least six weeks and you take another X-ray. When you take that X-ray at six weeks, that fracture becomes obvious. So there are certain fractures to you take the X-rays at two occasions, okay? When you are seeing the patient and then you delayed the next X-ray maybe until six weeks when deformities and everything movement would have displaced the fracture it becomes obvious, okay? So you take X-rays at two occasions. If you intervene, you put a cast or you operated the patient, the second X-ray or the second occasion is after that your intervention. So the rule of two has to be has to be adhered to if you want to have a proper x-ray and proper interpretation, okay? So, and when you have your x-ray, you have to interpret it. You check the, the, the limb that has the problem. For, for this x-ray we have, it is showing us what? The forearm bones. And it's also showing us what? The meta, the, the kappa as well as what? The metacarpals of the hands. And it's also showing us the distal half of the humerus, okay? So we are seeing both AP and lateral because you have to tell the person who you are interpreting this X-ray to. This X-ray is adequate or not? The joint, hello, I can see the joint above and the joint below. So my comment generally to the examiner will be that this is an adequate, Show me the joint above and the joint below. Sorry, I had some interference from somebody calling me, sorry. Okay, so after you have done that, we now have to look at the segment of the bone that is fractured. We said we are seeing the fracture of both the radius and the ulna. okay? So what pattern of fracture? From what I can see, I can see that one of them is transverse on the AP view, if you can look at the AP view critically, okay, you see that the honor bone, the honor bone is a transverse fracture. The radial bone, okay, 
All right. So, how do you the owner? It's showing us an oblique view. Okay. Though, if you look at the other fragment of the owner, it's just showing you as if it's a lateral view. But if you look at the proximal fragment, it's an oblique fracture. Okay. So, at times you have to be very careful when you want to interpret X ray, especially when you are describing the pattern of that fracture. Okay. So, and then you have to also note the location because these are the at the junction between the proximal to third of that fracture, I mean of that bone, and the distal one third. It's a junctional fracture, okay, for both the radius and the ulna. At times, we also have to describe the displacement, okay, but I won't bore you into that very much. Maybe when we are discussing X ray properly, we will now discuss the various types of displacement we have whether we are having an angulation, a translation, okay, and all that. So other investigation that can be done is a CT scan. Usually for fractures involving the joints, X-ray may not be adequate to delineate the various bone fragments. So if you have an intraarticular fracture, then you may have to also request for what a CT scan to be able to note the various fragment and to be able to plan so that you can be able to do a proper reconstruction of that particular joint, okay? Also, at times, we require to, be, to do an MRI, okay? But these are in rare cases. In other sites, in Klein now, usually once the patient comes to the trauma center, they pass you through a CT scan. We we'll call it total body CT scan. That is being done in some developed country. But in this part of the country where resources, we don't have much resources, and uh, most of our hospitals don't even have the CT scan. We depend on the X-rays for our diagnosis most often times, okay? So next slide, please. So other investigation you need to do, uh, your blood investigation, which usually you should have taken when you are doing your ABC of resuscitation, okay? To determine the I mean the urine, I mean the urea and uh, the the ureal uh, creatinine as well as the electrolytes composition of the individual. For females, if some of them become unconscious, so you may not be able to elicit their last uh, menstrual period. So it's also advisable you do a pregnant test for them, okay? So that, you be, that will also guide the management of this particular patient. Now treatment, as I said earlier on, is multidisciplinary. It involves the orthopedic surgeon, the general surgeon. If there is a head component, the neurosurgeons will also be involved. The plastic surgeon, once you have soft tissue defects that cannot be closed primarily, okay? You also require uh, the physiotherapist, okay? The nurses, so it's a multidisciplinary, a radiographer, it's, it's multidisciplinary. It involves virtually cut across, the management cut across almost all the discipline within the hospital. And the aim of our treatment, as I said earlier on, is to save life. Because the person must be alive before you can treat his fracture or before you can treat further. Then you can now, after you have saved life, you now save the limb, okay? Because there are certain life-threatening conditions that threaten also the limb that can lead to compartment syndrome and the loss of limb. So immediately you keep the person alive, attention has to be shifted to the limb because you have to treat the limb of any limb threatening condition such as compartment syndrome. Then we also, the aim of our fracture management is to achieve union, to achieve fracture healing. So we also want to aim at also achieving a fracture union. And then finally to restore the individual back to the system, that is rehabilitation. And so we are going to divide this segment of treatment into three emergency treatment, which you give to, to the patient in the hospital. The definitive care, which is, if you follow your ATLS, the definitive care comes in, okay, as your tertiary care or as your tertiary survey. Okay, trying to restore the individual to normalcy, to integrate him back into the society. So next slide, please. Sorry. I like teaching, so sometimes my presentation is more like a teaching section. So, because you need to also understand this so that you can be able to save life, okay? And then save the limb. 
and then restore function. So in emergency care, it is based on what our advanced trauma life support protocol, which we have what the primary survey and the primary survey is what ABCD of resuscitation, okay? It is aimed at was identifying life-threatening condition and treating them. Your secondary survey is to identify missed injury during your primary survey. So at this time, this patient has been stable. So you now want to do a secondary survey to look for those injuries that were missed earlier on. And then your tertiary survey is your definitive care where you involve other specialists to manage the various injuries. Okay, so in the emergency care system, the emergency care system actually starts from the field at the scene of the accident, where we have paramedics outside the country, they take care of that. They rescue the patient, extricate the patient, transport the patient on the spine board, okay, set a line for the patient, okay, in the ambulance van, and then take the patient to the hospital. And then the hospital care now starts. Okay, so we need to, in the hospital, what we need to do, we need to resuscitate the patient based on what our ATLS protocol. And we just talk, discussed the ATLS protocol. You have to ensure airway, patency, as well as cervical spine stabilization using your Philadelphia collar. You have to ensure the patient is breathing and you also give oxygenation, okay? Okay, so you identify any uh, life-threatening breathing conditions such as open chest injuries, tension pneumothorax, uh, massive uh, hemo, I mean, hemothorax. Okay, so you have to identify life-threatening condition in the chest, okay, that, and, and cardiac tamponant that can kill the patient and treat them. Okay, so after the patient is being resuscitated, okay, when you are doing your secondary survey to identify other injury, this is a point you now have to splint. Temporarily, you split your fracture. Once you see the deformity, you splint the fracture. Why are you splinting the fracture? You want to splint this fracture to maintain the normal anatomy of that particular limb. You also want to avoid further injury from the bone ends, from the fracture bone ends, because they can cause secondary injury. They can injure the vessels, they can injure the nerves if you don't splint them, okay? And then splitting again also what reduces pain for the individual. So it's going to reduce the metabolic response to that particular trauma. So splitting is an essential part, okay? In the management, in, in the emergency care management of a fractured uh, individual, a polytraumatized patient. Then after you've done that, Resuscitator, you have to give analgesia. The patient is in pain. So you have to give analgesia, okay? Give a proper analgesia. Then for those who have open fractures, you want to give an antibiotics to prevent what? Infection. Because for an open fracture, there is a communication between the body and the external environment. So less than three hours is being advocated, okay, from the time of injury to prevent what infection and the antibiotics you give, I uh, usually we recommend a second generation cephaloporin, okay, second generation. Usually we use what cefroxin or kefroxin. So for a gostilo one or less. We just give a dose of what? Your cefroxin for prophylaxis. Then for those with gostilo 2, the risk of infection is higher. So you give both a gram positive and a gram negative antibiotic. So you give a kefroxin and you give gentesin or, or metronidazole, okay? To, 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 for, to cover both aerobes as well as what? Anaerobes, okay? So your go, if Gostilo 3, 2, you give two antibiotics. But for Gostilo 1, you give a single antibiotic. So that is also the import of the Gostilo and Anderson classification in the management of an open fracture. Then also you have to give an anti-tetanus toxoid based on the immunity 
or the immune statue of the individual. Because he has now sustained an open fracture, okay? Tetanus organisms can be found for, for injuries sustained on the farm, okay? Where you have cow dungs, okay? Bed dungs and all that, okay? The risk of a tetanus infection is high because those are the environment you find tetanus organisms. So you also have to cover the individual on tetanus prophylaxis status of the individual. If it's immunocompetent, may just give a single shot of the tetanus toxoid, okay, as a booster, okay? But if he has got to immunize, okay, we just go for a wound debridement, okay? But in our environment, most people are not even aware of their immune status for tetanus toxoid or somewhat, or most of them has gotten it way, way back less than 10 years. And for such individual, you have to give a complete immunization. So you want to give both your tetanus uh, serum, okay, your ATS, and they also want to give the tetanus toxoid. The tetanus toxoid helps you to achieve immunity within 21 days. And if you are using the, your, your serum, your immunoglobulin, it takes you roughly about six months to achieve immunity. So we we'll call it an accelerated what? Immunization. You give your TT dose 0. Uh, five meals on contact with the patient, then you repeat it on the four of the injury, and then you repeat it on the seven, and it is believed at the 21 to 28, you achieve your immunity, full immunity, before your, uh, your globulin will act in six months' time. So usually we give them an accelerated uh, immunization. So you also may have to give your anti-DVT prophylaxis because some of them are going to be bedridden because of the injury they have sustained. Some may be unconscious. So you have to give what your prophylaxis for what for DVT because DVT are one of those complications that can arise from somebody that has been immobilized for some time and can cause what, I mean, the end result can be fatal, okay? Next slide. I hope, are we still together? Maybe I'm talking too much. No, yeah, we're here, doctor. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. So for the definitive care, once the patient is stable after managing the emergency situation, the patient is stable. Particular patient. This way now, we now have to sit down to treat the patient. And you know, treatment of fractures, can be done non-operatively or you operate, okay? And there are clear indications. There are clear reasons why you want to operate. And there are also clear reasons why you don't want to operate, okay? So it's not all patients that come, you may operate, okay? For children, most of the children fractures that are closed, we treat them with a cast. We treat them closed, okay? We don't bother to go and operate. One, because their fracture, heals very fast, okay? Their children, their, their potential of healing is faster than that of an adult, okay? And two also, most of their fractures do not displace much because their perosteum over the bone is very thick. And so the degree of displacement are usually less in children. So within six weeks, most of their fractures have healed. So once you are able to reduce your fracture and hold it in a cast, you don't need to operate them, especially children. Then there are also people who have extra articular fractures, okay? There are some fractures that are not in weight bearing region, like the lower limb, okay? And they are closed and they are diffusia, they're outside the joints. You can go once you're able to achieve reduction, you put a cast and it will heal without operation. Then there are also some people who are not really fit for surgery. They have a lot of comorbid conditions. Some of them, they have heart failures. Okay, their ejection fraction are less than 45. Okay, they are just quite moribund. If you look at their ASA grading using the anesthetic uh, assessment, their risk is quite high, like four or five. Okay, so some people, you don't need to subject them to more trauma, I mean, to more uh, to, to surgery because surgery is going to increase their morbidity. So what you need to do in such unfit patient, you then manage their what fracture 
non-operatively by using casts or use tractions, you place them on tractions on the wood and all that, okay? And then there are some people who don't want even surgery, who decline surgery. So if you can't, if they decline surgery, then you have to manage the fracture non-operatively. So these are the few conditions where you can also manage the patient non-operatively, okay? But there are certain fractures that you must fix, okay? We call them a must fix fractures, okay? One, when we have articular fractures, you know, the joint, the joint, maintain the congruence of that joint, okay? The movement on that very joint without friction. But when we now have a fracture that extends into the joint, it tears the articular cartilage and then develop a step. And so there'll be incongruence between the joint surfaces. And that will lead to wear and tear easily and then result in what arthritis. And as such, for all articular fractures, it must be fixed. These are the fractures that must be fixed, okay? Because when you fix them, you, you reduce the, the fracture, you, refuse, you reduce the, your, your fracture anatomically, okay? And what we only accept is just a little step off of about a two millimeter, okay? So it should be anatomic reduction, okay? So that there is no step off, okay? And that will now restore the anatomy of that particular joint. So those who have articular fracture, you must fix them. And those who have open fracture, you have to operate them. Okay, so you have to do a, a wound debridement. You have to take them to theater and explore that wound. Okay, and then stabilize the fracture. Okay, using your explant or your external fixators. Okay, so all those who have open fractures, you need to explore them. Okay, next slide. Then there are some fractures that you cannot reduce them uh, without doing an operation. Okay. They are very difficult to reduce. So once you have fracture, you can't reduce them. And I thought, uh, you can't reduce them, then you have to operate them, okay? Then there are also uh, fractures that are sustained because of a disease bone, such as pathologic fractures. All pathologic fractures must be fixed. Okay, these are conditions. Okay, there are some that the muscle actions, especially muscles of, I mean, uh, some of those fractures in the proximal thigh, in the proximal femur. You have to go and fix them, okay? Then we also have uh, those who sustain multiple fractures. Their nursing care will become very difficult. They have fractures here, fractures here, fractures there. They are unconscious and all that. And you can't give them a proper nursing care. So in order to fracture has to be fixed. So those with multiple fractures, in order to aid nursing, you have to fix them. Okay, next slide. So, so these are the indications for operating and then non-operative management of fracture. But how do we actually manage this fracture? The principle of management of fracture, why you have to reduce that fracture? Because now we have done resuscitation, we have resuscitated the individual. We are now looking at the limb. So we have to reduce the fracture. Some of the fractures are displaced. If they are not displaced, you can just put your cast and manage it non-operatively. But some of them are displaced. Some of them are intra-articular, some are pathological, and then you need to operate, okay? And if you need to, if you need to treat this fracture, first of all, you have to reduce them and then hold them in position. So you can do it either by a direct method, your reduction can be by a direct method visually. That means you have to open the fracture and go and see, or you do it closed, indirect ways. You can use an indirect ways to manipulate it. Okay, somebody do traction and counter traction and then you manipulate it indirectly. You are not seeing the fracture. But at times you can also manipulate them under fluoroscopy or under CM. It's a form of X-ray that takes motion picture. And as you reduce them, you look at your X-rays, you take your X-rays or you, during the fluoroscopy, you look at your reduction. And once it is acceptable, you now hold that fracture. 
a cast, okay, or if you are operating, you either use a plate or a screw to hold it, or you use some wires, or you put in an intramedullary nail. Okay, these are all options of holding what a fracture. You can also hold a fracture externally by putting what your skin traction. For children, you can put a skin traction with weight. You put 10% of your weight, and that will give and that will give traction, okay, to the patient while his body serves as what a counter traction, and it might reduce the fracture and hold it for you. So and you measure the contralateral limb. If they are equal, you know that you you have. A, a reduced fracture. So you can, you can hold it either with tractions, you can use some external devices such as casts to hold your fracture once it's been reduced, or you can use some implants, okay? Nails, wire, plate, and screws, okay? To hold your fracture. So the first thing you need to do is to reduce your fracture, and then subsequently you hold your fractures, okay? So you can also use your skin traction to reduce your fracture, give it traction. Why somebody give you counter traction? Okay, you can use a skeletal traction. You pass a pin, what we call a stemman pin, through the uh, through your bone fragments, and apply weight. And that weight is going to give it some traction. Okay, so you can also use a cast to hold your fracture, your POP cast. It could be your POP, or it could be your fiberglass cast. Okay, it can be used. Okay, if you want to fix them internally, you can eat, employ the use of plate and screws. You can also employ intramedullary knees or trace we have. You can see the A, the first one. Hello, Dr. Park, are you with us? Can you point the first one with the proximal, with the knee proximally? The first image, a hair A. So that is a nail placed into the bone, okay, to hold that fracture, okay? We we'll call it an intramedullary locked nail. Look at it, it's been locked proximally. It's not a full x-ray, so you didn't see where it was locked distally. Then the second one is a plate and screw that was used, but they are specialized plates, we call them anatomic plates, okay? That, that is a 95 degree, the plate is 95 degree. You look at the degree of curvature of that plate. It's a 95 degree angle blade plate, okay? And in between it, going through the bones are the screws holding it in place, okay? Then if you come down, sometimes some of these fractures, you can use some prosthesis, some joint replacements for them. Those that are badly fractured, that you can't put together, you may now decide to use some of your prosthesis either for knee replacement, if it happens around the knee, or around the hip, you use your hip, uh, a total hip replacement for them, okay? So uh, if you also look at the other picture, the man with the coalesce cast, okay? He had a fracture and we hold, that, that fracture was held in the cast, okay? So that's another way of holding uh, your fracture, okay? So there are various methods of treating a fracture and there are various methods of holding the fractures after reduction. Okay, next slide. So how do we manage an open fracture? Why are we talking about an open fracture? Because we said an open fracture, the hematoma communicates with the environment. So the risk of infection is very, very high. Okay, for Gosilla and Anderson 1, the risk of infection is less than, it's about 1%, 1 to 2%. Then for GOES low 2, the risk of infection is as high as 10%. Then for those with GOES low and Anderson type 3 open wound fractures, the risk factor, I mean, the, the risk is almost about 30%. So with the increase in energy, with the increase in the gradient of GOES and Anderson, the risk of infection increases. And as such, we have to, we have to prevent infection because that is one of the goal of managing an open fracture. The goal first is first to prevent infection. If there is infection, you have to eradicate it, okay? Then before you now stabilize your fracture, you reduce your fracture, you stabilize it to encourage what? Healing. So the first thing we do, if an individual comes to an emergency with an open fracture, we have to resuscitate the individual based 
Anstroma Life Support Protocol using your ABCD of resuscitation. Once you have resuscitated the individual, there are adjuncts you have to give because it's an open fracture, because the risk of infection is high. You have to give analgesia, proper analgesia to control the pain. You have to give anti tetanus prophylaxis to prevent tetanus infection. And then you also have to give an antibiotics, okay, to treat your infection and also serve as a prophylaxis. For Gostilo 1, you require only one single antibiotic, but for Gostilo 2 and 3, open wound, you require a combination of two, at least two antibiotics. For Gostilo 1, we give second generation cephalosporin. Then for Gostilo 2 and 3, you may not have to add a cover for anaerobes, so you can give your either metronidazine or genticine, okay? And then you have to splint your fracture, okay? To reduce pain, to reduce further injuries, okay? Are you getting me? So that is essential for an open fracture. Then what we do, we have to get rid of infection as well as contaminants because some of these injuries were sustained on the roads, in the farm, okay? So there are, there are foreign bodies within this particular wound. Debridement. We have to go and explore the wound. So what do we do in wound with debridement? We cancel the patient and then take consent to take him to theater so that we explore the wound. So what do we do in the theater? We have to excise the wound, okay? So there are dead skins around the wound. Those skins that are dead, you have to excise it. That is what we call wound excision. Then the next thing, what do you do? You meet the fascia. Any fascia that is dead, you excise it completely. So that goes along with wound excision. Then the next thing you need to do is what? Some of the wounds are punctured. Some are just three centimeter and there are contaminants inside. So what you do is to extend your wound. So the next E is to what? Wound extension. You now extend the wound on both sides so that you'll be able to have an adequate view and exposure of the wound, okay? And then those gross contaminants, you can see a foreign body, glass, or whatever you can see there, dead, you remove them, okay? If there are glasses, you pick them out. So you fill for them and you pull them out, okay? And then after you've done that, you have removed foreign body. There are bone fragments that are not attached to any tissue at all. All those bone fragments that are lying freely in the wound, you remove them because they will serve as foreign bodies, as needles for infection, okay? And then you leave those healthy ones, those are, that are attached to soft tissue because the and the contaminants you could see, then you now have to irrigate the wound copiously with normal saline, okay? Because there are some microorganisms you cannot see. There are some little fragments that you cannot pick them all out. So once you irrigate the wound by using normal saline, it has to flush out uh, any foreign body or contaminants, okay? Or organisms that are contaminants that are residing there, okay? So for Gostilo 1, what we advocate for is that you use at least three liters of normal saline during your irrigation, okay? And irrigation under low pressure is being advised, okay? Because you can do it under jet, high pressure using jet. But when you are using jet, it's going to cause micro injury to those tissues, and then it may force some of those debris into the wound, deeper into the wound, instead of bringing it out. So what is being advocated is a low pressure wound irrigation. So for Gostilo 1, you use about three liters. For Gostilo 2, you use six liters. Then for Gostilo and Anderson type three open wound, you use nine to 11 liters of normal saline, okay? so. Stabilize your bone, okay? You reduce the fracture and then use your explant. We use implants that are placed outside. And those implants are called external fixator. It could be a monolray, it could be an LRS, depending on what you want to do. Or it could be the circular frames that are placed outside the limb, okay? And use it to stabilize your fractures, 
okay? Then soft tissue reconstruction is essential because you don't want to leave the bone exposed. The bone must never be left exposed, otherwise the bone will die, will desiccate. So, and as such, you also need a plastic surgeon with you at times. If you have a ghost and anderson type two and three in the theater, because some of them have to raise a flap for you. Once it's clean enough, they may have to raise a flap to cover the bone, because if you don't cover the bone, you are going to, the bone is going to desiccate, it's going to die, and then you'll be left with a square stream there, and the bone will not heal. Okay, so you do your skeletal stabilization, then your soft tissue reconstruction will follow to cover the bone, and then you now rehabilitate your patient on the ward, and the rehabilitation has to do with physiotherapy. You have to mobilize the patient out of bed by giving him walking aids, okay? You have to ensure that the adjoining joints are moving so that you don't have stiffness. And then some of them may not return back. Once they return back to work, they may not be able to cope. So you may also have to work, give them occupational rehabilitation, okay? Some may have to change their duty posts, okay? Either maybe if he was in the field, you may have to now go and do more of office work and writing. He can sit down and write instead of engaging in the other rigorous activities for him. So rehabilitation is all a lot, I mean, it's a lot because you want to restore the patient back to normalcy and to the society. Next slide. So in management of open fracture, these are the principles. First of all, you rescue the patient, you resuscitate the patient. After resuscitation, you give your antibiotics, your anti-tetanus prophylaxis, your antibiotics, then you go take the patient to the theater. You do a wound debridement. It's a surgical way of what getting rid of the wound, dead and dying tissues, okay, as well as foreign bodies and contaminants. So you want to render the wound clean. So you do a wound debridement, okay. And after that, you ensure your soft tissue cover and you rehabilitate your patients. So all the story we have been saying so far in management of open fracture can be concluded in that five statements. Okay, you resuscitate your patient. Okay, after resuscitation for an open fracture, you give an antibiotics, anti tetanus prophylaxis, anti DVT prophylaxis, okay, antibiotics, and then you do a wound debridement for this particular patient and stabilize the fracture by using an external fixator. Then subsequently, you rehabilitate your patient. So, rehabilitation after we treated this patient in the TR tab, either a closed or an open fractures, what do we need to do? We need to rehabilitate the individual. We need to restore his function. Okay, we need to reintegrate the patient back to the society. So for physiotherapy, we need to mobilize the patient. Some of them have a, a fractured limb, so they can't be using that limb. So you have to what? Take them out of bed, okay? And how do you take them out of bed? You invite a physiotherapist so that he will give them a walking aid, train them how to use either an axillary crutches or a walking frame or a Zeman frame, okay? So that the person can take care of himself at home once he leaves the hospital environment and can move around. And okay, and that will also prevent the patient from developing what? DVT, which is a complication of prolonged immobilization on bed, okay? Then also the joints, the adjoining joints, must always be put in motion. So the ROM I put there is range of motion. So there must be range of motion of the joint to prevent what knee stiffness, to prevent joint stiffness, which is a common complication when you don't move the joint. Okay. And also occupational rehabilitation is important. Okay, because the patient may not be able to function in the previous capacity. So the patient has to be rehabilitated to take new roles, okay, to be able to sustain himself. All right, next slide. So we're going to discuss complications. Fractures also come with complications, okay? Complications can be as a result of the injury itself, or maybe as a result of what? Surgery, or maybe as a result of your intervention. So, and the complication, we are going to group them into those that come early and those that are late. So what are the complications that are early? One, the fracture ends can injure what? Your blood vessel and your nerves. So your vascular injury is an early complication that can come or you can see, okay, following a fracture. 
Okay, you can also have shock for those who are like the femur. Once you have a fractured femur, you lose about one to two liters of blood. So if you have a bilateral femur fracture, you can lose as much as three to four liters of blood and the patient may go into shock, a, a, a hypovolemic shock. So hypovolemic shock is a complication following fracture. When you have pelvic also fracture, pelvic fracture, the, the pelvic vessel can accommodate as much as two to three liters of blood. And that is much. And an individual has, I mean, has about 5.5 or five liters of blood. So if three liters of blood is being sequestered in the pelvis, it means the patient is going to go into shock. So you have to resuscitate such people with blood, okay, and fluids, okay? So that's also a complication. Fat embolism, you know, the bone marrow also contain fats, okay? We also have what called marrow fats, okay? Fats are also fine in the bone marrow. So when you have fractures, there's going to be disruption of the blood vessels. And some of these fats can find their way into the blood system, okay? And cut what we call what? A fat embolism, which is usually fatal. It's usually seen within 24 to 72 hours following fractures, especially for those who sustain multiple uh, limb fractures. And so you must also watch for such complications, okay? Usually you start seeing some of them becoming breathless, complaining of chest pain, particular hemorrhages around the neck, okay? Uh, uh, some may also have some mild fever, okay? And if you check their SpO2, it's low. So it should also raise your suspicion of fat embolism. Some of them may urinate and you may find uh, fat bubbles when you take those urine to the um, lab for examination, okay? Then also infection, because once you have an open fracture, the risk of infection is increased. So once you have fracture, uh, uh, I mean fracture, an open fracture, the risk of uh, ostitis, that's inflammation of the bone, gangrene, okay? Some organism can get sequestered within it and cause gas gangrene in the limb for you. So infection is, infection is also a complication following an open fracture. Then compartment syndrome, which is very dangerous, okay? It's an orthopedic emergency, okay? And usually what happened in compartment syndrome is that there was, there, there was bleeding into a tight osofacial compartment. You know, the leg has a very tight compartment. The leg has about um, three compartments, an anterior compartment and a posterior compartment. The posterior compartment has a superficial compartment and a deep compartment. Okay, so when you have a lot of bleeding into this compartment, it can increase, it will increase the intracompartmental pressure, the pressure within that compartment. And that is going to compromise blood supply to that limb. And so before you know, you now start having swollen. If you move the in person's uh, digits, or if you move his uh, toes, if it's on the leg, if you move the toes, they will be very painful. And the pain is usually out of proportion to that fracture. At times, some of them demand a lot of analgesia. I keep giving analgesia, they are still complaining of pain, keep giving analgesia. You should bring, I mean, you should bring the suspicion that you are having a compartment syndrome. Once the pain exceeds what naturally the patient should experience during a fracture, then you should suspect that you have a compartment syndrome. And if nothing is being done, it's going to compromise the blood supply to that particular limb and will lead to a complete loss of that particular limb and result in book my ischemic contracture and that. So if you see some of the people coming to us uh, in our clinic, we call something Voxman ischemic contracture. Okay, you see them with some funny deformities of the hand. They have gone to traditional bone setters uh, who has applied tight spleen across their limb and has cut off blood supply. So before you know, the limb is subjected to what we call a compartment syndrome, okay? And then they develop what we call what? a Voxman ischemic contracture, okay? The muscle get damaged, okay? Undergo healing by fibrosis, and then they are now being shrunken. And then that, that, um, that shrunken has caused contraction of the tendons and resulting in Voxman ischemic contractures. It's, it's, it's a serious complication that needs to be attended to, all right? So um, we also have um, some late complications, okay? Uh, infection, chronic osteomyelitis can 
can fester infection can persist and fester and form a chronic osteomyelitis. You can also have joint stiffness. Most of the joints are notorious. If you don't move most of the joint for more than three weeks, they become very stiff. So stiffness is a problem. You can manage, you can treat a fracture. And if you don't tell the person to move it or send you for physiotherapy to move it, you have another problem at your hand. The stiffness becomes another problem in your hands. Then we also have what we call mus uh, mustitis ossificans, okay? Because of the micro injury to the muscles, some of those micro injury result in spinification, okay? They deposit calcium, and before you know, it was fight to become bone. So you now start finding bones within, okay? So it makes the most, it makes that particular joint, okay, very stiff, okay? And so it's a complication, okay? And it has to be treated, okay? That is why usually we don't allow people to massage uh, injuries around the elbow because they cause microtrauma. And that elbow region are prone to mousitis uh, ossificans. Mousitis means mus muscle, okay? Ossification means bone, okay? All right? So when you have islands of uh, bones formed within the muscle, we call it mousitis ossificans, okay? Then uh, some, some of the bones can also die because blood supply has been cut, from, cut off from them, especially femoral neck fractures. Once you have femoral neck fractures, the blood supply to the head of the femur is precarious. And so such fractures can disrupt blood supply and the bone will also die. And once that happens, we'll call it what? The vascular necrosis of the head of femur. Could also occur in the humerus and in other bones, also in the scaffold where the blood supply to those bones are precarious. Then some of the fractures may not heal or may heal it. So in such case, it's a complication, we call it delay union because we expect most fractures to heal in an adult for lower limb within three months, for upper limb within six, uh, within six weeks. So if the time exceeds that, I mean, if the, the healing goes beyond that, okay, and the bone refuse to heal after six weeks for upper limb or 12 weeks, we now we term it a delay union, okay? Because within three months, we expect most of this bone to heal, okay? Then some of these bones may malunite, okay? The alignment of the bone actually was defaultive during our reduction or during reduction, okay, or during manipulation. And if you allow them to heal, they will heal with some level of rotation or translation or overlap, okay? Or with some form of angulation. And when it occurs, we call it a mal union. And then some of them, they refuse not to even heal, which we call non-union, okay? Uh, non-union, there are a lot of factors that result in the bone not to heal, ranging from the injury factor to the patient factor, and even to the surgeon factor. Because the injury factor, high energy injury, the likelihood that not, you have no union is high, okay? When there is soft tissue, devitalized soft tissues, uh, when there is uh, soft tissue loss and there is no blood supply around the fracture, it will not heal, okay? Then uh, if there are infection around that area, local factors, it will not heal, okay? Or there'll be a delay in healing, okay? Then uh, if the person has some, Okay, if the patient is on steroids, if it's a diabetic patient, okay, if it's on chemotherapy, a cancer patient, there's usually a delay in what? Healing, okay? Or somebody who smokes, it depresses the osteoblast, the bone forming cells. So there'll be uh, a delay in healing or non-union, okay? Or at times there could also be muscle intervening between the fracture segment. The fracture segments are not in contact with each other. And once you have a complete loss like that, because of the intervening soft tissue, it also results in a fracture non-union. So these are some of the complications of fractures. And some people may come with some of these complications. So as doctors, you should be able to identify complications that will arise from the management of your fracture or so some of these patients will come with such complications and you have to identify them and treat them. Now, prevention, prevention, prevention is key. 
most of the cause of fractures we have in the environment, 90% are due to uh, trauma. In short, they said trauma, according to WHO, trauma is a leading cause of death among the young, okay? Between the ages of zero to 44. Either from road traffic accident, from gunshot injury, now that we have a lot of um, kidnappings, terrorism, okay, violence, we expect a lot of fractures, road traffic accident, bad roads, you expect a lot of them. And there is an added that said prevention is better than cure. And so we should also encourage that uh, we should also preach about prevention. So somebody says, if I preach prevention, how would the customer come to me? Well, I would not pray for, we don't pray for each other. If they come, we have to fix them. That is our job, okay? So we have to prevent fractures. And you can prevent fractures at three levels. Mm -hmm. At the primary level of prevention, at the secondary level of prevention, and at tertiary level of prevention. Primary level of prevention, you want to prevent even the fracture to occur. So at that level, what do we do? Advocacy, health education. If it's for road traffic accident, you have to advise people to drive, I mean, to drive not under the influence of alcohol. They should avoid alcohol, not to drive under influence of alcohol or substance, okay, or substance abuse. So you have to disabuse your mind on such harmful practices. Then use of safety devices, such as your seat belt, okay, setting also speed limit for cars, okay, also passing some legislations, okay. Uh, government should ensure good rules. All these cumulatively will what prevent what fracture or prevent what trauma, which will result in fracture. Okay. Secondary level, if the fracture has occurred, what can we do? We need proper hospitals around. Okay. We need emergency medical services around resuscitate these patients once they come. So those services must be provided. That is secondary level of prevention to prevent complication. So when it has occurred, we have to prevent complications. So we need good medical services, good ambulance services, okay? We need good hospitals to be able to manage uh, trauma, okay? So that we can prevent problems, okay? We need good experts, trained doctors, trained traumatologists, Okay, so at that secondary level of care, that those are the preventions we need. We need those facilities to be able to prevent. Then tertiary, tertiary level, you want to prevent deformities and other complications, okay? So that is where you need to provide good facilities for rehabilitation and all that will be captured on that, that particular tertiary uh, prevention. So in conclusion, it is important we are able to identify fractures as well as other life-threatening conditions, okay? So once we do a prompt resuscitation and we manage these fractures adequately, it will help to stem the mortality as well as morbidity associated with what? These conditions. And as we said, prevention is quite better than cure. Thank you. Thank you for listening. So we're going to take... Uh, taking all your time because I didn't take this as a presentation. When I knew my audience, I said, oh, let me impact knowledge on them, not just running through the presentation. Thank you. So ideally I can present it under 15 minutes, depending on my audience. So, but I love teaching and because of my audience, I said, I should go down and explain so that we'll all be on the same page. Thank you. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We sincerely appreciate you. Sorry, I did not introduce you early on, although they already knew from the forum already. But may I also um, introduce our, our lecturer today, Dr. Eugene B. He's a consultant orthopedic surgeon at the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital. Um, thank you very much, sir, for the lecture. We sincerely and gratefully appreciate the lecture. Um, please, thank listen. you so much, doctor. It was very, very wonderful. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If there's any question, please, you could kindly just ask.
Uh, doctor, please, can you, um, you mentioned the, um, the dosage for the oxygen flow to correct the oxygen depth in uh, resuscitation, please, sir. Can you repeat it? I couldn't take it down. Okay. Uh, usually when you sustain trauma, okay. So let me just take your question straight. You uh, currently, okay, that's the dosage. Okay, for trauma patients. Okay, if you have done an um, advanced trauma life support uh, program, okay, if you have gone for ATLS, uh, you find it in an ATLS student manual, okay, 15 liters per minute, okay. So, usually, what, what happens in trauma is that once there is trauma, there is activation of what we call metabolic response to trauma, the oxygen consumption increases, you know, your respiratory rate increases, okay? Your, the, your, your cells also metabolize faster, you understand? So they use up oxygen at a faster rate. And as such, it's advocated that once a trauma patient comes in, there is, there is already a depth, an oxygen depth in that particular individual. Usually it's advocated you give a high flow oxygen, 100% at 15 uh, minutes per liter at the initial phase of the resuscitation. Okay, doctor, thank you. Also, doctor, yeah. you mentioned that um, there are some people like that, that are unfit for surgery that uh, yeah. we can um, conservatively manage, but there are also some surgeries that you must operate. So what do yeah. you do when like these both situations occur in the same person? All right, thank you very much. Uh, you know, having a live person Having a life person is more important, okay? Provided the condition is not a limb-threatening condition. If the fracture does not lead to a limb-threatening condition, you can still manage him non-operatively. There is what we call bag of bone. You look at the patient's life expectancy at times, you know? You look at the patient holistically. Is this patient going to surgery? Is he going to come out alive? If the anesthetists are telling you, hi, the risk is almost, 100% that the chances of coming out alive from the theater in this individual is not what to do it. You understand? Then in, in that case, you don't operate him, okay? Are you getting me? Okay, because yes. some of the, ana the anesthetic agent we have, okay, can cause hypotension and worsen the patient condition. If his heart is very free and cannot tolerate a lot of fluid and cannot respond, okay, to, uh, to uh, what do I call it? Uh, your your neuro, neurovascular response to stress cannot withstand it. Then you don't need to go in because you have a dead person in your hand. It's better you have a person alive. So once you have an articular fracture, fracture you must fix. You understand? And if provided it's not limb threatening, you leave it like that. Okay? Um, God has so made it that um, the gift God has given to man is that. A fracture will heal, a bone will heal, provided there is no intervention. Once there is a contact between any bone, it will heal, okay? But the problem now is that, is it going to heal in an acceptable position? That is where orthopedics come in, the knowledge comes in. Is it going to heal with some rotation, some deformity, okay? So life first, then limb follows, okay? So in such a situation, the guy has to be alive first. But if an aesthetic said, they can give you another form of anesthesia, okay? That the person will still be alive. Then you now go and operate. When a situation you have a life daring situation, then the person must be alive. The fracture must be just be left there and be managed non-operatively. Because even the joints, um, your joint fracture too, you can manage it non-operatively, okay? You can place them on traction. And some of these things through ligament ligamentous taxis, some of the fragments fall close to each other and they will heal. It just that it may not be acceptable. The risk of uh, may be high, but having a live patient is better than having a good limb and you've lost the person. So it's a give and take issue. Once life is involved, you leave the person alone. In those conditions, you leave the person with his condition. Because, you know, in medicine, we talked about do no harm. The patient should not return to you worse off. You understand? Mm -hmm. So somebody who came to you alive and because of a fracture, none dies. 
And you were told from the beginning, it's not encouraged, you understand, to do that, okay? So a doctor should know when to operate and when not to operate. So as you are growing up very soon, you now start knowing conditions you don't need to operate, okay? Because there are some people, if you operate them, you lose them. And then if you must go and operate, then the person should be ready to take the risk. He either goes in alive or come out dead. He takes the risk. If he comes out alive, good and fine for him. Understand? So the risk aspect must be left for the patient also, okay? Because the fact that you have an ASA 5E does not mean you shouldn't operate. You understand? But if the patient relative and the patient is ready to take the risk that they, they told him the mortality is 100%, he's ready to take the risk, then the doctor has no choice after you have cancelled the patient. You understand? So these are some of the decisions you learn as you go in the profession. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Um, Thank you. So, have a wonderful day. Okay, um, thank you. Sorry, um, I know you guys you spent a lot of time, you understand? Um, the lecture will soon end. Um, first of all, um, so let, let me also thank you again. And um, uh, this is for your benefits, you guys. So, um, could you just talk to them about a Pfizer plate fracture, especially the classification where it does come out? The okay, artificial. classification. Yeah, there's a okay, sort of Harris. Yes, sir. Yeah. And please, again, for, for you guys, please note one thing that that 15 liter per minute is, is because that's also a question. How is it administered? It's administered by a rebreather mask, face mask. That's for you, just by this, by the way. So, sir, could you just talk to me about this? Please, 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 just two minutes okay. or something like there, that. There is, there, is a face, there is a face mask that has. Now, um, as he has just rightly said, it's through a facial rebreather max, okay? Now, if you have done an ATLS, most of all these things are in ATLS, manual, okay? The rebreather max gives you 100% oxygen. It has a reservoir for oxygen, okay? And it's like a, a one-way valve also. You breathe in the oxygen, push reservoir, okay? The, a later section of it where the oxygen, the 100% oxygen concentrates. Okay, so that's what you usually use, not through NASA prongs. Okay, use a breather max. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Paco, for that. Now, we also, I, at the beginning of the lecture, the first slide, I said fracture can occur through the growth plate or through the physis. We call the growth plate physis. Okay, it's another name for it. Okay, and usually, we see the growth plate in what? In growing children or in pediatrics, okay? Those between boys between the ages of zero and 18 years and girls between the ages of zero and 16 years, okay? If you look at an immature bone, I don't have the, maybe what we'll do, I'll paste the immature bone. I'll also paste the pictorial classification of it. But I'm going to discuss the classification before you go, before, that will be escalated to your WhatsApp group, okay? Now, the growth plate, if you look at the bone ends, the, 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 the an immature bone, you have the epiphysis proximally, okay? Then between the epiphysis and the diaphysis, you see a radiolucent line on X-ray between that two bone, between the epiphysis and the metaphysis of the diaphysis. So that line you see on X-ray that looks like a fracture in a growing child, it's not a fracture, it's called the growth plate, okay? It's called the physis, okay? And why it is like that is because it contains chondro, chondroblasts. It also contains osteoblasts, okay? They have not been calcified of calcium, so you don't see them how you see a bone on X-ray, okay? The calcium in them are less than what is in the bone, okay? They have not acquired and you see it as a metaphysis. So that radiolucent line you see on an immature bone on both sides of the epiphysis, 
we call it what the growth plate. And we said fracture can happen along that growth plate. Okay. A fracture can happen, okay, and separate the epiphysis from the metaphysis. Okay. When you have a complete separation or a displacement or a fracture line through it, okay, Sutter Harris now classified it as Sutter Harris one. Mm -hmm. Now we use his name for is for, for, for you to remember it easily. Eh? We use his name to remember that classification. Sota S A L T E R. Okay, and if you count it, there are about six. Okay. Hello, are you with me? Yes, doctor. Have you written the sorter down? S A L T E R, sorter Harris. So we use his name, okay, to easily remember what that classification. Are you getting me? So the first S for sorter means separation of the physis, separation of the physis. So as I said earlier, once the fracture occurs through it, there will be separation. It can be minimally displaced or totally displaced. That is called what sorter type one. So once there is a separation at that growth plate, it is sorter Harris one. Okay. In sorter Harris two, in sorter Harris two. There is a fracture, there is a separation, and then the fracture now extend, okay, into the metaphysis. Into the metaphysis, not epiphysis, so into the metaphysis. So it gives you one, a triangular piece at the end of the bone, okay? Do you get me? So the A means fracture above the physis. And that physis is into that metaphysical region, not into the epiphysis. Okay. So for Sultan Harris too, we have a fracture through the physis extending into the metaphysis. So it gives you a triangular uh, bone, which you are going to see, which we call the Thorston Holland's Thorston Holland's fragment. T H. Thorston Holland's fragment. So a sort of type two is the commonest type of fracture we see in children that has physial fracture. And it comes with that fragment, Thorston Holland fracture. So when I get the picture of this thing, I'll send it to him, he will paste it on your WhatsApp group. Then, so I said, start at, the first S is what separation of the physis. This The other letter following it is what A, above, that means there is separation and then the fracture extend into the metaphysis above, okay? Then the third letter, And you see a fracture extending into an epiphysis and going into the growth plate, three word fracture. Because there is a, there is a separation and it now extend into the epiphysis. That's lower or below, the L means low, below the physis. It's okay. Then the uh, T in Salter, S A L T, that's type four now. Type four is that there is a fracture that involves the epiphysis through the growth plate into the metaphysis. It goes from the joint, passes the growth plate, and enters through the metaphysis. So it involves, we call it a through and through fracture. So the T means through and through. The fracture line goes through the epiphysis, goes through the growth plate, and goes through the metaphysis. So it's a true and true fracture. So that is Sutter Harris type four. 
Okay. Now, we say Salter. Okay. Now there is a fifth one. Salter Harris five. In Salter Harris five, there is what? A cross injury. The faces are crushed together. There is separation, but it's crushed. Okay. And so once you have that crush, a crush injury, we call it a type five, what, injury. Then the type six, it happens around the, if you, if, if you trace the five six to the lateral end, once you have a fracture, just only at that isolated point, at isolated edge of it, mm -hmm. we call it per, per, perichondral ring. Mm -hmm. That's the R, the last R means rank. It was rank, it was named after the man who added that to the sorter. Sorter originally was five. Then rank, R-A-N-G, added the last one, the sixth one. When you say there is a perichondral crush, eh? or perichondral injury to the physis, it's now called the type C sorter, okay? so. The mnemonic sorter is used to describe the classification of what a facial injury. The first type one sorter S means that there was a separation of the physis. Okay, so it could be displaced or not. In type two, the fracture now extends from the physis into the metaphysis, giving a triangular portion of that bone. Okay, which we we'll call a type two, or we we'll call it a Thurston-Holland fracture. That's the commonest type of fracture you find in children. Okay, then in type three, it goes below the physis. So the the fracture line extend into the joint, goes through the physis, go through the epiphysis, and extend into the joint. Then in type four, is T. It goes through and through all the tree. So it frac the, the fracture line goes through the epiphysis into the physis and into the metaphysis. Then in type six, I mean type five, there is a crush of the plates. Usually you don't see it on X, you don't appreciate it on X ray except on MRI. Okay. And some of the diagnosis in type five is later in life. When the patient comes one limb is shorter than another, you can't even figure out what, what was the cause of shortening. But if you ask him, there was a period he fell, and he couldn't use the limb. There was a complete crush of that plate. And so the entire limb, this top part of that limb, did not grow. So the other normal limb will grow longer than that. Okay? So it's usually a retrospective diagnosis we make for that, because if you do an X-ray, you don't see it. But if you do an MRI, you will see it. Then the type C is when is the rank classification, when it occurs at the perichondral ring injury or crush at the perichondral ring. That's the edge of the physis is an injury there, okay? So this is just the simple way of trying to remember. It's a mnemonics. You use Sutter's name to memorize the type of Sutter Harris fractures you have in children, okay? Sorry, I was supposed to take that in under peculiarities. But my sister was giving me problems. So when I was compiling it, I was it just skipped my mind. Okay, thank you very much, sir. For, thank you so much, Doc. For the lecture. We do appreciate that. And we hope that subsequently, if we call on you, sir, you could <laughs> reply. You, you could uh, come up and uh, give us more lecture again, sir. No problem. It's my, it's my pleasure to be here and also to teach. Teaching is my passion. Sorry, I took much of your time, but I wanted to just explain fractures to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much, like sir. Thank you so, so that much. Also become better doctors, okay? Sorry, have any of you done basic life support or advanced trauma life support? Of course. No, doctor. Okay. But well, that uh, I think every doctor before or during his internship, because uh, we have to.